For the Wild podcast and all of our other projects are community supported. Please head over to kickstarter.com and search One Million Redwoods to make a pledge and help us plant millions of trees, native plants, and fungal companions to mitigate climate change and rapid species loss. The silence is broken by somebody crying Trying to be heard, never a word Always the attitude, sort out your own Always alone, wishing for something The world is denying Out in the wilderness, somebody's crying Somebody wishing for something to happen Wishing to tell, wishing to help Someone was listening, someone who cared Never despaired Someone to lean on and someone to trust Who needs your assistance and finds your disgust Hello and welcome to For the Wild podcast. I'm Ayanna Young. Today we have the honor and pleasure of speaking with Pua Case. Thank you so much for being on the show with us today. Hello, hi everyone. I want to just begin this conversation by sharing my gratitude for you and your work in the world and the mountain that you live in devotion to, Mount Akea. It's really an honor to share space with you in this way. And I'd love to ask you to open this conversation up in any way that you feel called, whether that's a prayer, a song, or a bit of the story of Mauna Kea, you know, how Mauna Kea has guided your life and the life of your community and the lives of your ancestors. Sure. I will start as I would when greeting my mountain or my people, and I start with introducing my mountain. So Mauna Awa Kea Ku'u Mauna, Mauna Kea is my mountain. Waikoloa Ame Kohakohau Ku'u Mau Kahawai. Waikoloa and Kohakohau are the waters that flow and nourish me. And Pu'ukapu Ku'u Onihanau, Pu'ukapu is the place of my birth. And I come from Mokokeave, island of Hawaii, which many will know as the big island. But it is Hawaii Island, Mokokeave. And the reason that we start by introducing our mountain, our waters, the place of our birth and our island name in cultural protocol is because they are more than mountains and water and land masses. They are ancestors. They are teachers. They are our link to our lineage, and they remind us of our responsibility. And when we speak their names first, we are also reminded that what we in a conversation, especially a conversation that is reaching beyond our community, beyond our household, to places where we will be speaking for the first time to many ears that have not ever heard of us. We are therefore reminded that what we say, we say in the best way that we can to honor the mountain that I'm looking at right now, the highest mountain in the world from the seafloor, that I am accountable and responsible for what I am going to be saying here right now in this moment. So I need to be reminded of that. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I introduced myself in that way. Well, thank you for reminding all of us to be accountable and responsible for the places that hold us and that relationship 
with land that is so much deeper than the dominant culture conditions us to believe. And I want to speak about your mountain. And from what I understand, there has been scientific infrastructure or development atop Mount Achaea since the 1970s. And in the past decade, there have been plans brewing for the construction of the largest telescope in the Northern Hemisphere, the TMT, or 30-meter telescope, which, after a lengthy contested case hearing, which you were a part of, was approved this September. And I looked through the Board of Land and Natural Resources statement on the decision, and honestly, much of the wording just made me sick to my stomach. I want to read a few quotes so that the audience can just be aware of of what's coming out of this. Quote, the TMT will not pollute groundwater, will not damage any historic sites, will not harm rare plants or animals, will not release toxic materials, and will not otherwise harm the environment. Another quote, the TMT site and its vicinity were not used for traditional and customary Native Hawaiian practices conducted elsewhere on Mauna Kea. Another quote, some Native Hawaiians express that Mauna Kea is so sacred that the very idea of large structure is offensive, but there are already 12 observatories on Mauna Kea, some of them almost as large as the TMT. They will remain even if the TMT is not built. No credible evidence was presented that the TMT would somehow be worse from a spiritual or cultural point of view other than the large observatories. This conquer culture really never ceases to shock me at this point anymore. Not only was the land underfoot the development stolen by the U.S. government, but also the unique endemic species of Mauna Kea are threatened with extinction in this new climate paradigm. And if that's not enough, you are still being asked to define the sacredness of Mauna Kea within the bounding terms of the colonizer. Oh, my goodness, yes. Well, first of all, all of those comments that you uh, read out, first of all, are all false as far as what we have not shown evidence about, what we have not proven, or what the TMT is claiming the corporation is claiming as no impact on the mountain. So if we look at the TMT, well, we'll look even before that. The first small approval for a really tiny structure on the mountain came in 1968. And with that approval, slowly over time, it's very tricky how some of those other telescopes became approved, if you will, based on the first permit, based on approvals after the fact. There's a lot that went on for the first 13 telescopes to be built on the mountain. And I have to say, there's always been opposition to all of the telescopes being up there. But what made this one erupt? into a unified force of people to say enough is enough is one, the fact that this TMT will be 18 stories covering over 12 and a half acres on the northern plateau, which is pristine, not developed at all. There is no more room for any more telescopes on the summit. The summit has been completely filled and altered with all of the telescopes up there. So now they have to move into an area that I look at every morning, the Northern Plateau, they call it, and the telescope would, if built, be erected, constructed there. So we entered into the case as the last of six petitioners in uh, about 2010. The ruling was favorable for the permit after the contested case and then the groundbreaking in 2014 was going to take place 
And that's when it was stopped by the people. So in order to see the immensity of what happened right there, we take a look at the Hawaii that is known around the world, paradise, tourist mecca, beautiful scenery and landscape, and all of that is very true, aloha spirit, Hawaiian culture. Really, I think the world had no idea. Well, they still don't. They don't have an idea of the issues that we face on a daily basis from bombing on the slopes of Mauna Kea, live fire, to GMO, to overdevelopment in our whole island chain, to all of the things that we face every day. There's an issue for every moment in Hawaii. But you don't see that. So when a people said enough is enough, this will be the one too big, the one too many, the one where you have overstepped, you are not welcomed here on the Mauna, the one that will cause irreparable damage, even as cited in UH reports, that this would be irreparable damage to the mountain, even then, I think people had no idea that coming forth out of this permit application would be a rise of our people who would say, not this time. This mountain is still sacred and we are connected to it. But not only that, you have to meet eight criteria legally binding in order to build in a conservation zone on the top of that mountain. And there is no way that building this monstrosity will meet the eight criteria to build. But still, the permit is issued. We stand for the entire 2015 We go up and protect the mountain by being there 24-7. There are arrests made. There are stances made to protect the mountain. And then at the end, we win in the Supreme Court in December. What do we win? We win the right to start all over again with the second contested case hearing, which, of course, ended with the result being that very quickly the board approved the permit, no matter what we showed, no matter the evidence. And the approval was given for the permit again. So now we are in appeal to the Supreme Court one more time. We are awaiting a date for the application that we have turned in for the appeal. And if need be, we will stand again. I believe that it has been reported by the TMT Corporation that if they don't begin to build in spring of 2018, they have located an alternate site, which is the Canary Islands. We are not advocating for the TMT to go to the Canary Islands. We want to make that clear. We are not looking for another people who will have to oppose and stand as we have, unless they want it there. And maybe they will. I don't know that, but we are not advocating for that. But we are saying not this time over our water source, not this time on the top of a sacred mountain, and not this time on a land base that you cannot even meet the criteria to build on. But still you will. And I believe that's because it is not only scientific and education, which is always, pardon me, everyone, rammed down our throat. We are manipulated. We are bullied. We are coerced because in the name of science and education, we are supposed to say yes. But no, not anymore. So I believe it is because it is five countries that have band together to propose this, that the permit 
must be given by our government, no matter what. And so we are forced into a situation where we will rise. And that is what we are doing, plain and simple. just said so many potent statements that I want to circle back around to and thank you for, well, one, just explaining the complex legal system that this whole infrastructure of telescope is a part of. I mean, it's complicated, I think, for a reason. Also, you spoke about these other issues in Hawaii, the GMOs, the bombings, and it's so important to recognize those things for outsiders or for mainlanders who may look at Hawaii as this tropical paradise vacation area, not really understanding the depths of the issues that are going on that you are at the front lines of, and to really respect the trials and tribulations that you're dealing with. And and then I just also want to mention, I can't imagine what the impacts and consequences are of you having to communicate this intrinsic connection to the mountain in a way that is palatable for Western judicial system, the government, and academia. You know, I, I do want to ask, how is that on your spirit to have to you know, mm. put this sacredness in this boxed in terminology. You know, it's all in the name of science, all in the name of education. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on how you walk the line between the two as you are praying and singing and dancing and connecting, but also having to live in this colonizer judicial world of, of <laughs> uh, I have a lot of words for it, but I'll just stop myself. First of all, you know, we have to understand that we are born and raised into this system, colonization, Christianity, the patterning that occurred here in Hawaii has occurred many, many years ago. We, we grow up in this system. We understand that when we defend, protect, or even in daily life, Hawaii for us is not a state of uh, the United States of America, you know, by way of our history and illegal annexation and all of those things. But having said that, we are in a society here that is very westernized and has been assimilated, whether it's through our education, our government, economics, you know, we are part of it. We are in this. And so we are no stranger to this kind of living where we are attempting, where we are managing to live, not in both worlds, we only in one world, but managing to keep our own culture, connection, traditions, languaging, spirituality, uh, deities, all as intact as we can and yet operate and maneuver in a system that is not very often set up for us to be successful. So we, we are knowing and understanding this is the life that we live in. But at the same time, we are also very aware that we are in that moment in time. 
here in Hawaii, and I know for many other Native peoples as well, because I'm well-traveled and I have been to other front lines and have been an ally elsewhere as well as a frontline Native here. So getting to see the different movements, we understand, I think, as a planet that we are in a very specific time right now where if we do not stand for what we deem sacred, what we deem essential to the existence for the next seven generations of a culture and a way of life, that we are not, we are not willing to give up. We are not willing to do that. That we have no choice. We have no choice. Those of us in this, We have no choice but to stand. But having said that, yes, it is exhausting. It is challenging. It is consuming. It is a 24-7 for some of us. But yet, there is a beauty to this time that I am so glad to say that I am in it. The witnessing I see of a transformation of the young ones into the warriors that are going to steward and safeguard is beautiful. That we are managing to stand before it is too late is by far just magical. That we are able to see that this unification is occurring from Hawaii to all parts of the world and that people are standing because we are standing and we are standing because others are standing and we are joining in this grid of energy, high energy in this dimension that was prophesied long ago that we will stand and we will be they who were before us all over again. Those things make this worth it that we can still hear the spirit world giving us directions, that the mountain is our chief and our leader. And what the mountain says is what we need to follow. Those things are ancient. There are knowledge and customs and traditions just following the voice of your ancestors because you still hear them, feel them, and see them. Those things were commonplace in our past. And now we are beginning to hear them again. And because of that, this entire issue of building a telescope on our mountain, we say you thought you were going to raise a telescope, but instead you have helped to raise a nation. And for that, we see it all in its place, where it is all meant to be. So because of that, it's not as exhausting as it could be. And we have not really come into a danger yet at this time in our stance. Yes, we have faced police. Yes, we have faced armed officers. But we have managed to do that in a way that has not caused a harm to us that might occur this next time around if the National Guard might be called or the military base, which is right downside of the mountain. So those things are something that we are considering right now as we take our next steps. What's going to happen if we have to go up there the next time? We know they're going to need to get us off quickly because they want to be able to say to the TMT Corporation that there is a go-ahead here, go ahead and build. And so they'll need to get us off very quickly this time. So there's a lot to think about here. There's a lot for every movement to think about when they are considering standing. It's not something to be romanticized or in any way looked upon, like, oh, everybody, let's go run up there. You know, there is danger there. There's harm that could happen. But yet, we have to, like all others who have to. But we also see the beauty 
in what is occurring, the music that has come out of this movement, the the ways in which we are safeguarding our Hawaii, the bravery and the courage that have come out of this movement, the alliances with Standing Rock or California tribes who are standing for their salmon or their life ways. I could go on and on about what has happened that is so positive that it balances what is taking place here. But in the end, they cannot build on our mountain. It is not good for anyone. So if I will go into the spirit world for a moment, we know that our mountain speaks to the mountains around the world. We understand that there is an energy grid, a fascia, if you will, in that communication between the mountains. We have to be careful how we treat our mountain tops. The energy that goes from one mountain to another is essential for this planet. And we know it, and science knows it, and education knows it. We all know it, but we know it from the spiritual sense. So so we must help to protect that, that grid, that unspoken communication. And so I stand because of that. I stand because the mountain has asked me to try one more time, and I will. But for all of us, we stand for our own reasons, but we are also standing for the integrity, for the sacredness of that which still teaches us, shapes us, leads us, protects us, and that is our mountain. I just am so chilled in the best way by your connection to this mountain because I I feel the mountain as you speak and I loved what you said that they thought they were going to build a telescope but instead this is building a nation and I feel that in your words and I feel that in the the news and the stories that have been coming out of this movement that you've been so pivotal in and I appreciate your deep understanding that this is necessary and this is beautiful but it is not something to be romanticized and it's not something to go into without a lot of mindfulness and thoughtfulness and prayer and for many of us out there who are awakening to the realities of this time I think so much comes up for different people whether that's debilitation or rage you know this fire to fight back or to shrink to stand up and there's many ways to show up in this time and I feel so resonant with how you are guiding folks to stand up in the way that is in love and listening to these spirit guides that you're speaking of. We made a pact early on that there would be no leader that would come out of this movement as far as human beings. There might be some like myself, I'm speaking to you right now because I've been in this and perhaps I have a role here where I am speaking. But in actuality, in reality, there are no true leaders for this movement. The mountain is our leader. We listen to the mountain. And when I say that, and when people say, well, how can you listen to the mountain if you can't hear the mountain speak? This mountain, by means of the chant and the messages from the ancestors, has always been the realm of the gods where our genealogy ties to the heavens, to our ancestral realm. It is where the deities and the elements dwell in nature. So because the mountain is deemed as you would perhaps think of it as a temple and a sanctuary if you look at the mountain like that there is a behavior an expectation of conduct isn't there when you go to a church you don't just go in there and bring your weapons in there and fight in there and swear in there and be less than when you enter into your holy place So the mountain is a holy place. So just by means of that, the conduct in which we must abide by, 
when we go up the mountain, even to stand, we have to think about what would the mountain expect of us as far as our behavior and conduct when we are standing on the mountain. Now, when you have thousands of people coming up to stand, not everybody is in a place yet where they can hear that message or where they know immediately that the hills and and nature itself, the plant life, the birds, the air, the wind, they are all messengers. And they are all reminding us of how to stand. Some people are there yet. Some people are being schooled. Some people aren't even there. They just know they have to run up a mountain and stand there, but they're not sure why. But the mountain is our training ground. It is a beautiful place to hold us accountable. And we are not there yet. We are in the learning and the training. And as you say, all of the unseen beings there, the elemental beings, the nature beings, we say that the mountain is even where the ocean begins. So all of the ocean is up there in the form of the rainfall, the snowfall, precipitation. All of it ends up back on the mountain. So every element is represented on the mountain. So we are in, in a way, we are all abiding by that when we are standing on the mountain. And for some of us, we understand that already. For me, I am learning. I am training. The mountain is also my teacher and also corrects me when I need it. Because we are young in this movement We are young in how to stand and protect our mountain as a unit. And so this is what we say to those who go to any movement, but I will just speak coming up the mountain. If you come up our mountain to help us, to stand with us, one, we say you are a guest. Come as a guest and we will instruct you and guide you and do not overstep as we would not overstep when we go to help you. We are your tent line. We are quiet in our movements. When we come to your place, we know protocol. We know how to ask permission. We know how to remain silent. We know how to help when we are requested to help and we know how not to, when we will get in the way. We ask people to not judge us. We are new at this. We are working it out. We are learning how to stand, how to move, how to feed each other, all at the same time. How to stand. So don't judge us. We are doing the very best we can with what we know and what we are learning in the moment. And it is not easy to do all of that. So if you must judge us, then please go home. Be compassionate. While we are working it out, just hold us. That's all. So there's so much that goes into this from the realm on the other side, from the realm on this side, But I am just one of many, many in the Mauna Kea Ohana, many in the world Ohana family that are beginning to see that this is what we must do and that it's part of our responsibility, one, as humans, but also as Native people of these places, we were given the privilege of being able to say we were first to a place because we made an agreement in our ancestral realm that we would take care of it. But outside forces make it extremely difficult to take care of the places in the ways that we should be. So this is what we are here for, isn't it? To try to work it out. So when I'm looking at the mountain right now, I see a little bit of snow left on the mountain. And I know that Poliahu, the snow goddess premier, is in residence. And when she snows, she reminds us that they are still in charge. 
that we are in their domain. And they could easily shake every building off of the mountain. But I believe that they have allowed this process to work its way through because they have seen that we have needed the schooling and the guidance and the opportunity to stand together. So they are allowing for that. But the mountain has already told us that the TMT will never be built. So we must trust and believe in that, that when the time comes, if need be, and we can stand no longer, we will turn it back to the mountain herself and say, it is your turn. You take care of it. We have done the best we could. And I've seen that happen in other movements. And that could happen in ours if we are not successful in the physical But I trust that we will be. So much came up as I was enveloped in your your words and your energies and this idea of, you know, being young in the movement and being schooled and having humility when showing up and the protocols of how to show up. And it makes me think about the scientists and the academics who are not heeding that warning of how to show up in a good way and the humility of knowing their place on earth as as young ones and not as the rulers and the ones with power and I can understand that through a scientific lens there's this yearning of wonder for the stars and the cosmos and to feel like you're a part of something greater than yourself and but it seems that now in this age of the Anthropocene, then instead of revering the night sky in awe as this grounding force in our smallness in the universe, the stars have become this next frontier in the dominant culture, as all the frontiers on this planet have been pillaged and mined and logged or just covered in garbage and plastic. How do we carry ourselves in this end of times, this extinction period, when all the ice is melting, the flames are engulfing, especially where we live in California, Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, the soil are no longer willing to nurture food plants in the same ways and rivers are losing their water and there's violence and aggression. And I could go on and on on these atrocities that are happening. And and I guess I wonder... 
you know, when will the point come when enough is enough? When will the grieving beings be enough to stop the quest for the next frontier once and for all? And deeper than that, I guess I'm wondering, when will we face our mortality as, you know, not just as individuals, but as a species? And this is a an intense question, but do you foresee a time when humanity will be asked by the earth to begin to hospice ourselves? Well, I would say that's happening right now. I'm seeing that every day. I'm seeing that happen everywhere. When you look around at places, you know, we are all isolated in the world that exists right around us. But if we really were given the opportunity and the lens to see what is happening, real devastation on other places on this planet. It has already begun years ago. This is years in the making. We are being given the chance to do what we can right now. But I'm going to take it back a little bit because there's some things that you said that I really want to address, especially about the scientific community economics, corporations, it's much more than science. It's a lot about money. Money goes hand in hand with science in many times, many instances at the core of it all. It's like governments, it's corporations, it's economy, it's science, it's money, all of that. It's a big, huge machine. But backing up even more, you know, we're not against science here, even in the Mauna Kea movement, even when we're on Mauna Kea, we have said all the way along, this is not about science versus culture, but it is about versus irresponsible science. Because you come to us or anywhere in the name of science or education does not give you the right to take a people's land, to change a way of life create irreparable damage physically, emotionally, mentally upon a people or a place. Science alone by that name, education alone by that name does not give anyone the right. And I think that there was a time period where we almost thought that it meant they did have that right. And so that occurred. But at this point and time, Irresponsible science and education that is not grounded in protection of life ways and places and sacredness, that is not pono, that is not correct, that is not universally sound. We have the right and the privilege and the birthright responsibility to stand when that occurs. So what I would love to see evolve more is that when you are learning to become a scientist or even an educator, I've been a teacher for over 30 years. When you are being schooled, you are also being schooled on the impact. You are being schooled on cultural sensitivity more than we have been. You really realize as a scientist, when you come upon another people's lands about what that impact is and you understand what repercussion is and you know and you learn that whatever decision and impact you make upon a people doesn't end when you retire or when you leave a project. It continues and it impacts your children and your grandchildren. And when you know that, you be more mindful and more careful about destroying in the wake of pursuing whatever it is that you are scientifically set up to do, your experimentation, your hundreds and thousands and billions of dollars that you receive. You think about that that impact is going to go on and on, well beyond the time that you leave these places, because these scientists, they come and go. They come and go, but they are part of an everlasting impact upon a people and upon a place. 
And maybe if we receive a little bit more schooling about that, it might make things a little bit different. If you have a class on what it is to go in and destroy people's place and possibly their ways and the mental anguish and the heartbreak that occurs, maybe you'll think a little bit more deeper before you just say, in the name of science, and education we're going to build no matter what and we hope one day you'll come to terms with it and we might give you a million here and a million there per year for your mountaintop because let me tell you they get shocked when we say no there was a time around the world where people maybe would take that little bit because it seemed a lot And it seemed like you couldn't stand against this regime that comes upon your lands. But that's not occurring. We're not quick here to say a million dollars for our mountaintop. No money. No money. Because we have to answer to the ancestors. We have to answer to the seven generations before us and the seven after us. And so we are in complex times here. But we are all working it out. This is the generation of working it out. And who are we working it out for? The generation that is being born into this movement. So it is all happening as it needs to happen in this divine order. And I take comfort in that. And I just take my place. I'm just a baby in this. I'm only 50 some years on this planet a planet that has known thousands and thousands of lifetimes before us. And I just take my place in this little minute that I have here. I'm just a mere human being. What you are receiving from me is facts of a case. It is experiences and it is my thoughts. And for every thought that I have, there are thousands of Hawaiians with their own thoughts and their own reasons I don't mean to come across as being the all-knowing or knowing any more than anyone else. I'm just one unemployed water protector like all of the others that are standing at this time. I've given up my job to stand, but I've done that full well, full knowing, no regrets. I love this life of standing as difficult as it is. I could be doing something that didn't matter half of what it matters now. And I will say, because I truly want to be honest here, that there are consequences of standing that we all know, don't we? Water protectors, land defenders, warriors out there. What suffers in the most and what has to survive in the end is our families. Families take a toll during these movements. There are families that will break apart because of the way in which we move when we stand. There are days when we just have to make sure that our children even remember that we love them and they don't feel invisible. There are days when the young ones will say, I wish that you weren't a protector, that you just stayed home and were just like regular people. Why can't we just go to the beach? You know, that is what we are still navigating through, is how to keep our families intact how to keep ourselves from going into despair, hopelessness, when we have to get up and pay that one more court case, or we have to go and prove one more thing. So this is all a learning for us, isn't it? Water protectors, land defenders, warriors. This is where it is difficult. This part of it is probably the hardest and yet the most important. So that's where we are working it out still. And we want to make sure that we say that. That's why we say, don't glamorize this. 
we are working hard just to be able to maintain a family structure as we stand. And if we ask for prayers, maybe it starts there. Yeah. Wow, Pua. (laughs) You just have touched so many parts of my deepest self with your understanding of the movement and humanity and family and this divine sacrifice that you're speaking of. And I absolutely hear what you're saying. You know, when you made the comment of why can't we just go to the beach and why can't we just make art and why can't we just live as normal humans, whatever that is, but to stand in love and sacrifice for the land and for the water is all consuming, but it does affect other parts of our lives. And I am so grateful for your honesty and your directness in that, that it isn't a romantic part-time gig. I also want to just, you know, at the beginning of this question, you know, you had mentioned the hubris of science and the capitalist market and how that's really what is pushing this forward. There's so much money and academic prowess put into, let's say, these telescopes, another form of conquering, the conquering of the skies, the conquering of some type of facts or whatever they're looking for. It's not to say that there's nothing interesting in that realm, but there's so much going on on earth. There's so much going on right here under our feet that needs care. The biodiversity extinction crisis, polluted waters, protection of of so much. It's really strange to see this separation in people's minds. And then I also think about how science is dealing with climate change. And there's so much talk about putting billions of dollars into geoengineering, these really intense systems of spraying aluminum in the sky, instead of looking to these places and just protecting what we have or restoring Earth's natural systems. But there's this hubris there. And so that's why I asked that question earlier of when will we face this mortality, our mortality potentially as a human species, or it's this deeper question of, the dominant culture and science and capitalism pushing so hard, risking everything, risking complete toxicity just for one more dollar, just for one more day. But here we are on earth seeing the changes rapidly in front of us. And there's just this disconnect. And so I feel that when you're talking about standing, standing as these young ones, being schooled, being educated, being humble, but then seeing our human counterparts racing towards the cliff. And to try to take that all in and know the best way for those of us who see it in a way that you do to stand, but also to, you know, understand the powers that be that are really taking so much of the power and doing things that affect all of us in the end. As I'm sitting here, an owl has come into my purview here, into my eyesight, and it's flying around here. And for me, that's the Almakua, that the family guardian sees. Some people see an owl, I see a family guardian. And it reminds me to say that we have to take a bird's eye view instead of an ant view. This all could be very overwhelming. It is very overwhelming. And honestly, when I am sitting in, say, the Contessa case, and I hear Native Hawaiians or local youth who are pro the telescope, they actually are as passionate as I am about Mauna Kea. They are about exploring, even if it destroys in order to do that. So... I have to really broaden my spirit to understand where they are coming from, too. That is the first thing that I have to do, even if I don't agree with it. I have to understand that their passion is 
as my passion is, except it's on two different sides. So if I look at that already, I am a little bit clearer of what it is that we are truly either in opposition about or what really is the issue of or how we forward. So I have to look at that. But I will say that even as we are compassionate, And we are in aloha not because of them, but because that's what our ancestors perhaps expect of us in how we proceed. Because anger will not serve us this time. I know anger. I've been an activist since the 70s. I know what it is to be in rage, anger, depression, and despair from loss of so much of my Hawaii. And I know that it doesn't serve me and it doesn't serve our children. Our anger goes only home with them. So the way that we are standing now is out of necessity as well as being divinely led. However, what I will say to anyone coming up the mountain that will stand on the other side is don't take my aloha for weakness. I am fierce in the love for my Hawaii. And I will do whatever it takes in the end. But I will do it not in anger, but in the love of my land and my people and my understanding of what I must do. But again, we must also be straightforward in what we are going to do. But to look at all of those things that you just mentioned, for a weaker person, it could put us right down. You know what I mean? It could put us right under like, oh my gosh, this is helpless and hopeless. And we are delving into the stars when we should be taking care of our own earth. Yes, that is all true. Of course. But through the life patterns that we have seen for lifetimes in our history, we know that that is the way of the dominant culture, if we call it that, is to destroy and already be looking ahead. It destroys something and you know you're going to, okay, where's the next place we can go either to do it there or to try to bring about some restoration because we have just finished destroying something else that has occurred throughout history. This is not the first time that these corporations have come to a native people and displaced their cultural beliefs, rights, sacredness, broken laws to build what they want to do. These corporations This is commonplace for them. If you go back into their histories and their alliances, this is not new to them. They simply wait us out. They create situations in which we might turn on ourselves. They wait until we don't have resources. They got billions of dollars. This is a pattern. This is the strategy They'll start the propaganda. They'll advertise about education and science until they drown us because we don't have the money to go up against all of that. So in the end, we say if you want to talk about the money, the million dollars you will give every year, one million, we say there's 13 telescopes. How about they pay one million already? For the use, the free use that they have up there, there's no even rent charge. It's a dollar a year to be up there on that mountain. So why not you all pay? We'll get 13 million right now. We don't have to ruin anything else. So let's take care of that education and money part right there. We haven't even utilized what we could have learned out of that 13. So let's use what we already have. So don't use those arguments. Just tell us the truth. Why you really need that up there? Because all the other arguments can already, can already be just made very clear. We don't need it up there. 
But why is it that you have to build it up there? Is it because you're really looking at a hundred meters someday? We've seen that in the reports. So what is it? So we cannot really stay there so much in the day to day. We have to trust and believe in the universe. We have to trust and believe that there are enough of us as human beings that are seeing the bigger picture and that we have realized everything just in time and that there have been people throughout history who have always been the pillars, who have always known these things and they have kept us grounded just enough so that the rest of us can learn along the way. So although I could look at life in any which way, I'm going to look at my high mountain and I'm going to know that my gods dwell there and I'm going to know that it's going to be okay. And I'm going to do the very best that I can to make sure that that happens. But in the end, I'm going to trust and believe, pray harder, chant louder, Stand stronger. That's what I'm going to do. Well, I'm going to join you in that and do that for the mountain that I call home here in Northern California and the trees and the waters and the birds and the plants and the fungi who are kin and just gods. And I... Where are you located, if I may ask you? Where are you right now? I'm in Hawaii. Where are you? I am in the coastal Redwood Mountains, about three hours uh, north of San Francisco. Wonderful. You know, I'm very tight, California, mm. with the run for salmon, minimum wind to, and their journey and their stance to bring the salmon home to the rivers there. Mm-hmm. I know that there are situations for you in California that are big. That And right now I'm just praying for mm. those who are evacuating from the county of Ventura. So, you know, I mean, I understand that there is much everywhere. The major difference, I think, is that when you look at our land mass, everything that you are facing there and all across the continent, we face on an island the size of the head of a needle when you look at us in comparison. So we all are facing the same thing. We just happen to be on a smaller land base with the same issues. Lucky it's so beautiful Mm. that it balances out a little. (laughs) Lucky that it is not just beautiful, but that we have a coast culture with ways that are for the most part, intact that we can call upon and that we have these mountains that will protect us and steward us. We just have to remember and do our due diligence right back. Yes, and I think that beauty and that love is what will see us through day after day into the future for the next generations, that that love is fierce and gentle and tender and powerful and I believe that the forest here where I'm doing redwood reforestation feels me and I feel them and it is the most fulfilling relationship to be in love and in family with this land and know that I will show up every day for them no matter what no matter what the climate changes no matter what the government says no matter what will happen in the future, which I can't tell as a small human, but what I do know is my love is true. And I do know that the land's love is true. And that is enough for me. And I hear that in you. And it is so, it has just been incredible to listen to your words and have insight into how you see this world and your mountain and really this global movement that more and more people every day are awakening to. I want to thank you so much and just ask that 
you end this conversation in whatever way you feel fit for this moment. I want to open this up to you to choose. The way I want to end this conversation is truly by honoring. I want to honor all of you. First, from California, you have opened your hearts and your doors and your people to us so many times. So to all of the tribes that have taken us in and all of the allies and all of the people who might be listening who have supported Mauna Kea, who have supported us here in Hawaii, and we in turn who have supported you, I would like to honor you and then just expand that out to all of you on the continent who are standing for what you believe in, what is right, what is truth. I know how challenging it is and also how beautiful it is at the same time. And so love and light to everyone out there. Aloha from all of us here, but aloha from me, from my heart to yours. And I'll see you somewhere along the line, on a front line. And blessings for all of you who are standing right now on the front line. Our prayers are up for you. So thank you so much for having me on this program, for this conversation, for the sharing of heart space, and for the sharing of our mountains one to the other. And so I'm going to bid everyone a deep felt aloha. Aloha ya o kopakahia pau. Aloha to each of you. Heart felt, heart space, with the heart of a mountain. Aloha. Thank you for listening to For the Wild Podcast. I'm Ayana Young. Please support our Kickstarter by going over to kickstarter.com and searching One Million Redwoods to help us reforest these great living libraries of Cascadia. The music you heard today was Havani Rios with Ioni Apaa and Milani Macau. Our theme music is Like a River from Kate Wolf and Silence Returns by Bo. I'd like to thank our producers, Reach Out and March Young, our research director, Madison Nagolski, and media director, Molly Lebo. Like a river.